everyone's looking pretty technologically spry right now, which is always a wonderful thing. But if you run into any trouble, please let me know. I am the tech help. Uh, that is my name. So many awesome people in the room right now, Sc scrolling up through everyone's names, lots of different organizations represented, policy, nonprofits, gleaners, food councils, health workers. So awesome. Thank you all for being so much for being here. We'll get started in just another minute. All right, well, um, if you haven't already, again, just one last time, if you could put your name, join everyone in putting your name and organization in the chat. We just, um, this is the best way for us to capture who's in the room right now. We really appreciated that. And I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to the Main Food Convergence Project, session one of Track C, Healthy Food, Breaking Down the Barriers. Thank you so much for joining us today, this afternoon, into the evening. Um, this Zoom call was not how this convergence was initially envisioned, as you might imagine, um, but without being able to be in person and in physical community with one another, at least we can come together now and hold the space um, for networking and relationship building and doing this work together. So um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, for those who missed the opening session that happened on Monday night, um, there is a recording of that on the Convergence website and also it should be in your participant packet if you want to get a chance to check that out. 
um, the, in lieu of a nice thick folder that you would normally get at a conference, this participant packet um, on the Google Drive is your best is your best friend throughout this convergence. There's all kinds of good information in there. Um, so please if, let us know if you have any issues accessing it. Um, so starting out tonight, um, I'd like to invite my teammate Christina to lead us in a little grounding moment um, to start us off and bring us together into this space. Christina. Hey y'all, it's really nice to be here with you. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick little three minute grounding exercise. I will guide you in, I will guide you out. Um, if for any reason that doesn't feel supportive tonight, please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, and so if it's more comfortable, you can turn off your camera or leave your camera on. Um, but to get started, um, go ahead and find a comfortable seat. You can plant your feet firmly on the earth, put your hands on your lap, um, let your spine be tall. Um, the invitation here is to close the eyes or to cast a soft gaze downwards. And we're just gonna start with three deep breaths. So we'll take a deep breath in through the nose, open and sigh out through the mouth. Two more times, just like that. Deep breath in through the nose, open and sigh out through the mouth. And then one more time, deepest breath of the day so far. Open and sigh out through the mouth. And then you can let the lips close. And if you're not too stuffy today, just let an easy and natural breath come in and out through the nose. And we'll take a moment just to soften around the eyes and the eyebrows. You can loosen and unclench the jaw. Let the shoulders melt down and away from the ears. Soften any holding or tightness that might be in the belly. Relax the legs, let them be heavy. Let your whole body relax as much as it wants to. And just here in this space, take a moment to call to mind a person or an animal or a place um, that lets you feel really safe and secure. And imagine that you're in that place or you're with that being, they're here beside you. And just noticing how it feels in your body to have them here in your presence. And take a couple breaths to be with this resource. And then we'll slowly wiggle fingers and toes Start to deepen the breath a bit. And when you're ready, on an inhale, you can lift the heart. And on an exhale, you can slowly blink open the eyes or lift the eyes and begin to take in the color and the light around you. Take a moment to turn all the way to the right, all the way to the left. Take in the entirety of your space. Remember where you are. And whenever you feel ready, you can come back to community and to relationship. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Christina. That was um, a really lovely way to come into this space together. Maybe you all are coming from work, um, coming from another Zoom call. Um, so hopefully everyone enjoyed that as, as a moment to um, start being in this space intentionally. Um, while we're being intentional, um, I would like to make a land acknowledgement um, of where we're doing our work and where we're seated right now. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we farm, garden, fish, and work on the unceded territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Wabanaki peoples have stewarded the beautiful land we now call Maine for thousands of years and continue to today. The Maine Food Convergence Project stands in solidarity with Wabanaki land, food, water, and cultural sovereignty. We reckon with the past and ongoing harm and violence of colonization. Acknowledging the land is one small step of a long journey of truth telling, atonement and repair that can guide us towards our regenerative and equitable food system here. I'd like to take a brief moment to honor the Wabanaki Confederacy. We 
we must center Wabanaki leadership in order to vision a regenerative and equitable Maine food system. This looks like decolonization, reparations, and rematriation, and more. We refer to the racial equity in the food systems resource guide sent out in your participant packet for more information on any of these terms. Um, it'll also be put in the chat here. Um, also in the chat will be included some links to various um, Wabanaki um, organizations and initiatives, include, including Wabanaki Reach, um, which has been a partner uh, with us in this project. So those links, um, this, so you can follow those links um, for more information. So some tech notes. Um, I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with um, tech at on Zoom at this point, but um, if we are tech, if we are Zoom bombed, which oh, fingers crossed, nothing like that will happen. Um, we have a plan. Uh, we will quickly email you a different link to restart this meeting on a different account. Um, we ask that you please mute your, mute your phone unless you're talking or, you know, mute yourself in general, unless, unless you're speaking to reduce background noise. Um, if you need a bio break, please don't log off. Just make sure your, your video is off and you're on mute. Um, any tech questions, privately message Hazel or tech support as, as she has on her name, she can help you out. Um, please use the chat, chat option sparingly as to not distract from the presentations and discussions. Um, and then also a final tech note on um, recording and screenshots. Um, this is being recorded today. Um, and with the exception of the storytelling and the breakout rooms, um, and we will be taking some screenshots because um, that's the only way to get action shots in this Zoom world that we live in. Um, so if you do not consent to having your image as part of these files, um, you may turn off your video camera. Um, uh, my apologies, I'm just gonna back up for a minute. If we could get those um, links um, in the chat that I had just mentioned, I wanna make sure folks get access to those. Um, I'm gonna put them in. Those are the links that I mentioned um, for, for the, from the land acknowledgement. Um, so now I'd like to take a second to introduce our fabulous team. Um, I realize I have not yet introduced myself, which is not the greatest etiquette. My apologies for that. I am Shannon, um, I use she, her pronouns, and I um, am with Community Food Matters Food Food Council um, in Western Maine. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with all these individuals um, throughout this process, shaping this track. Um, Amara Fiji from Maine Environmental Education Association and Maine Youth Climate Justice. Um, uh, Rachel Emis from the Healthy from Healthy Acadia and Maine Gleaning Network. Harriet Van Vleck, Maine Network of Community Food Councils and Mary Meeting Food Council. Christina Colillo, uh, Somali Bantu Community Association in Cumberland County Food Security Council. Mary Turner from Good Shepherd Food Bank. Alexis Skye, who is helping with tech support today. Um, she is with the Healthy Communities of the Capital Area in Maine Snap Ed. And Hazel Onsrud is our tech facilitator. She is um, with the Curtis Memorial Library in Brunswick. Um, I'd also like to make a, a, I'd like to recognize that we have some amazing breakout room facilitators in the room. We have like 16 of you. So um, just, you know who you are. These folks will get to work with some of you in the, in the breakout room. So thank you so much um, to our breakout room facilitators for stepping up and helping us make this convergence um, even more uh, special and, and engaging. So um, for those who maybe missed the opening session, we're just gonna take a minute to really look at um, the, the convergence as a whole, as a whole project. Um, the mission of the Main Food Convergence Project is to develop deeper relationships and greater trust as we co-create equitable and thriving food systems for Maine. So a really emphasis on relationships, um, which is what we're gonna try to cultivate today um, here at, at, at this meeting. Um, the vision for the Maine Food Convergence Project 
is um, a main food system that fosters the well being of people, planet, and communities. And then also wanted to highlight some of the goals of the food convergence. Um, we all know how much quicker things get done when we reach out to someone who, who we know well for information or for help. And so the goals of work, our work together and this gathering are focused on building trusting relationships throughout Maine's food system that will help to catalyze collective action. So we're gonna to try to forge those connections um, as best we can so we can be looking towards um, enacting action down the road. It's also easier to get things done when we know who to call and why that person or organization will be interested in what we're doing. A second goal of the convergence is to create ongoing communication and co coordination systems that can help us work better together. So that's, that component's gonna come in in later sessions in the convergence. Um, next, I want to just briefly introduce um, this theory of change model that we're working with. Um, this is an overarching framework for this track. It's a way for us to capture and organize the ideas generated into an organic but cohesive narrative to form this convergence and beyond. Um, we've identified current conditions in our food system related to barriers to healthy food access, as well as a vision which we're using from the Heal Food Alliance that says, a system that is healthy for our families, accessible and affordable for all communities, and fair to the people who grow, distribute, prepare, and serve our food. So as our sessions continue, we'll continue to fill out this model and adjust it um, based on your um, based on your input and other information gathered during the sessions. Um, if you're not a huge nerd like me and um, that doesn't sound super exciting to you, that's that's okay. We don't have to worry about it just yet. Um, we'll be working more with this model and sharing our developments with you throughout the convergence. So to kick off um, our, our um, work here, we invited a couple of speakers to share a little bit about the work that they do. Um, we wanted to showcase innovative collaborations and initiatives that are getting healthy food to people right now. Um, so Jessica Richards is a health educator with Bucksport Regional Healthcare Center. Jessica works with patients in the local community to provide education, resources, and programming for improved health and well-being. And Ben Martens from the Fishermen's Feeding Mainers um, is the executive director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. And Ben works with Maine's community-based fishermen to develop projects, policies, and ideas to strengthen Maine's fisheries for today, tomorrow, and the future, and forever. Um, so we're just going to have our speakers talk for a few minutes about their work, um, explain what they what they do, um, and 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 then we'll have time for a quick Q and A. So if you have um, questions while they're speaking, you can drop them in the chat, and we'll just take a few questions when the speakers are done speaking. So um, let's start with um, is is just Jess, is Jessica here, or am I just seeing? Hi there. Yes, it's Jessica's iPhone. I switched from my laptop to my oh, iPhone here. Okay, that's why we couldn't find you. Um, so while we get you pinned, let's start with Ben then. If Ben, if you want to um, speak to your work um, with fish, Maine's, Fisherman's Feeding Mainers. There we go. Perfect. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Great. Um, so uh, thank you guys for inviting me and for pulling this together. It's, it's really pretty great to see all your faces. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben and I'm the director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and we are a small industry based nonprofit that works with commercial fishermen on a bunch of different issues, but most of them are related to fisheries policy in federal fisheries, uh, which is three miles offshore and beyond. And so uh, it wasn't until that, you know, we've, we've always dabbled in the world of food and trying to figure out how to be a better participant in the local food network that exists around Maine. But to be really blunt, we've had a hard time trying to figure out how fish kind of fit into the broader food network. Um, partially that's because of the disconnect that exists between consumers um, and their seafood. Um, one of our, our great uh, friends, Barton Seaver, who's a, an author uh, of cookbooks and chef, um, always says that you know, food comes from farmers and seafood comes from the ocean. 
And so we have this di disconnect between where people are getting their seafood from and it's coming from the ocean. So what do you need to do then? You need to protect the ocean. You don't protect the fishermen. Um, and a lot of that's just because of the barriers that have kind of been put up between how we get fishermen uh, connected to those who eat their seafood. And for the most part, fishermen view their work as catching the fish, landing the fish, and then going out and doing it again. Uh, and that's how a lot of our fishermen, even the small scale fishermen have operated for a long time in Maine. Uh, so when the pandemic struck, uh, we obviously had a lot of issues as everybody did when we were moving forward, trying to think about how we support the community-based fishermen here in Maine. And for a lot of the boats that we work with, um, a big component of their business is ground fish. So ground fish are things like cod and haddock and flounder. And most of the fish that we land in Maine come from small scale boats and they are fresh products. They lend, land on a high end restaurant tables. And so when all those restaurants shut down, we lost the majority of our markets. Um, most of the fish in Maine goes to the Portland Fish Exchange and it's a, a, an auction, there's a live auction there. Um, you're able to kind of see some of the metrics that take place. So over the, the first few months of the pandemic when fishermen were typically should be going fishing and then into the summer, we saw over a 70% decline in the value coming across the docks in Portland. And some of that was because of a lack of price. Some of that was because the fish was not even being bought by people um, because there wasn't enough market to do so. And it's caused fishermen to tie up their boats and stop fishing. Um, at the same time, we were hearing these horror stories about what was happening in our local communities when people weren't able to access food uh, and they weren't able to access good food. So we had fishermen who were tied to the dock not going to catch abundant resources out in the ocean because they couldn't get paid. And then we had people going hungry in our communities. So um, our team sat down and we started working with some funders um, on a national level uh, to try and figure out how we could address this issue. And we were, were very fortunate that we were able to get an anonymous donor to come in and build a project with us um, with some seed money where we were going to pay our fishermen a livable wage to go out and catch fish. We were gonna pay local processors to cut that fish in the working waterfront of Portland. And then we were gonna be donating that food into local food insecure populations around the state. Um, and so our, our biggest partner in that was the Good Shepherd Food Bank. Um, but we wanted to be a, a, good, a good neighbor, a, a good member of the community. And so we opened our arms wide and said, if there's other community groups that are interested that need, uh, you know, good sources of high quality protein, whether it's fresh or frozen, um, cut or whole, um, we wanna help. And we were really, really fortunate that we've been able to make a lot of great connections to local community groups um, and minority community groups. Uh, you know, first, first uh, the, the Wabanaki community has been able to participate in some of this as well, which has been really fantastic. Um, but it's it's been a really great way for us and our fishermen to get to know where their fish is going. Um, and feeding those within our communities. A, a lot of the seafood that we land in Maine gets landed here and immediately gets moved out of the state to places like Boston and Chicago and New York. And so we were able to keep it closer to home and, um, and do some good. And so we, we were able to you know, start the project with a, a, a grant, an anonymous grant, and we were doing a lot of fundraising. We are still doing fundraising uh, to keep this project going. Um, we, we saw that it was, uh, you know, what we built it as a, a quick response to COVID is turning into something that has built into a lot more value for the fishermen, for the working waterfront, and uh, for a lot of the communities who are, are struggling. Um, just this morning, I ended up uh, having to run down to Portland and picking up some fish that wasn't able to be sold on the auction. Um, and we bought it, we processed it, and we donated it into the bath. Um, the bath pa food pantry and you know they they love it they have got people lining up out the door to say you know give us the fresh fish because they don't get it normally it's, it's something that it's a treat um and you know i don't need to go too far into into the weeds but the the other piece of this equation is that seafood is one of the healthiest sources of protein that we can be eating um for our minds and for our bodies and for the ecosystem and um, there's some new regulations that are coming out that are suggesting from the FDA or not regulations but recommendations saying we should be getting our students and our kids to be eating a lot more seafood. It's good for their brains um, and development. And so one of the components of this project that we've been doing a lot more with recently is um, making sure that the food system, uh, the school system can get access to seafood. And so we've been moving a lot of our fish 
into the local um, school system in Maine, and also after school programs um, where you know, kids that need to go someplace after school can get access to um, good quality meals. And so that's that's been a growing um, piece of the project that's been really, really fantastic to see um, it having an impact close to home. So I'll stop there and um, I think that's enough. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Ben, for um, for telling us about your, your partnership. And it's great that it's started as a COVID response and it's building into something even with bigger intentions and bigger, bigger possibilities. So that's really wonderful. Um, Jessica, if you wanted to share about your work at the Bucksport Health, Bucksport Health Center, we'd love to hear from you. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica, health educator for Bucksport Regional Health Center. Um, it's great to see you all. And Ben, sounds like you're doing some really good work there. I love to hear about getting some healthy healthy meals and definitely some fish out to the schools because I there's so few kids who actually like fish. <laughs> it's so sad. They don't get it enough. They're not exposed to it enough. But um, so, uh, so I've been working for Bucksport Regional Health Center for about four years. And in that time, we have um, we've gotten involved with a few different programs to help our population have better access to um, some healthier foods, um, or at least learn about them and have some sort of access to them. Um, because, you know, as a health center, we, the vision was to, instead of seeing a health center as a place where you go when you're sick and we take care of you when you're sick, it's also a place where you go to prevent yourself from getting sick, but also to live your healthiest, happiest life that you can. Um, and so a part of that, of course, is having access to healthy foods. So a few of the programs that we've been uh, working on our um, community health and hunger program with Good Shepherd Food Bank. They've been wonderful in helping us to offer emergency food bags to our patients. Uh, so basically people are screened. Um, there's a couple different ways that they can get an emergency food bag and it is a, a well-balanced um, bag of hefty bag of food that they can take um, that day with them. And so uh, we use some different screening questions in our registration forms, um, but we also have, uh, you know, if even if you're not doing your patient registration uh, that day when you come to see us, we also have other means that you can get an emergency food bag. Um, and, you know, it's discreet. We have, uh, for example, flyers up on the wall. We've, we've kind of had to get creative because we haven't, we didn't have as much interest in the patient uh, registration forms, but we've gotten creative and kind of put something up on the wall that people can grab a little, um, you know, post-it note off flyer that asks the questions are, you know, you worried about running out of food? Um, have you run out of food? Do you need a, a, a bag of food today? Um, and that's started to work. People, you know, just grab the, the post-it note and bring it to the front. No, no uh, additional questions asked. So that's been a really big um, piece of what we're doing. Also, uh, once a month, we offer free uh, fresh fruits and vegetables through this program as well. So every third Wednesday of the month, we have um, fresh fruits and vegetables out on tables that for now it's outside with COVID. Um, and so that that's worked out well. People seem to be very happy with that. And I think part of that is that sort of grows. So people start to, I've noticed people are starting to kind of plan for that and expect it. Um, and then they'll ask on Facebook, do you have that today? And they'll come just for that food to the health center uh, to pick up a bag or two of, of food, uh, which is wonderful. And then um, some other some other partnerships we've made, of course, Healthy Acadia um, through their SNAP-Ed, the connection with SNAP-Ed program. Uh, we've had some wonderful assistance from um, Nicole over there. She's um, been able to help us to establish small gardens at Bucksport Regional where we grow. This was our first year this past um, summer and we were able to grow quite a bit of um, different edibles, greens and um, some herbs and tomatoes, all sorts of fun stuff. And it was wonderful to see um, the community, you know, see that and enjoy those things. They could come and pick from the garden, you know, as long as it's ripe, you can pick it. Um, and then also um, we were able to also use part of the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the, the name of it, but basically the excess food from the, uh, from other gardens in this, you know, in the state and other farms. Um, we were able to offer that out as well with Healthy Acadia and Maine Snapped. Um, so that, that was really nice to have that throughout the summer and the fall months. And then um, the last thing I'll mention is we've established a, a good connection with our school system, local school system, uh, RSU 25. We, we, you know, we, we began uh, the idea of having some sort of food pantry in their school system. Um, I think that was a few couple of years ago, maybe question might be three years now. 
And uh, now they are fully functioning um, food pantry program where um, mostly Miles Lane Elementary School is the one it's really, really using it the most right now. It's a backpack program. Kids get a, a bag of food. Um, you know, on a, on a Friday or before a vacation. And then the middle school has a small program like that. And the, um, the high school as well has some sort of, you know, small food pantry program. Uh, so we, we were able to kind of work with them, partner with them to help get that up and going. Is it certainly, you know, that to a school that, you know, of course, school systems there, they're already overwhelmed with everything, you know, going on. So to be able to kind of partner up and um, help that along is, I think, you know, that's vital to any school system getting a program like that going. Um, but I will say uh, we we do help every year. We we put on a little fill the cruiser event at the local Hannaford, and that has helped tremendously. We actually make a, a, a good amount of money from that um, funding for the school food pantry program. People are very interested in giving money to that when you tell them that it goes straight to the food pantry um, for the kids. And so that's basically, you know, money from people offering it out twice a year. Um, it's, we do it on our own with um, the police, of course, the local police department and the school system comes and helps and um, staff members volunteer and different things. And then also um, the one in the spring, we, we kind of um, partner that with the Hancock County Food Drive. So that's, um, that, that works out really well to have that all kind of connected. So uh, I, the last thing, I know I'm only supposed to speak for a few minutes here. So um, I just think one of the biggest things that, that I've learned and that we've learned in this is that partnering with other organizations to get these things going is so vital. Uh, you know, not only does it allow you to share resources and ideas, but it also, you know, what I find is it, it, it helps keep you motivated and keep you accountable so that we all have a lot of different ideas, but, you know, actually getting that idea, bringing that to fruition is the hard part, of course. So I think that um, the biggest key is really partnering with people um, in different organizations who are willing to partner with you. I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jess. Um, thank you both for your for your stories. Um, I've received a few questions. Um, we might have time for one more um, to be answered right now, but you saw we have some contact info that just got dropped in the um, chat for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and for um, and for Jessica at the health center. So feel free to follow up with them um, afterwards. But just real quick here, um, we I had a question um, for you, Ben, about um, concerns about overfishing. And so thinking about how the sustainability of increasing, you know, of wanting to get more seafood um, for consumers, if you could speak to that. Sure. How much time do you guys have? Um, I unfortunately, like, under yeah, right. Uh, so over overfishing is extremely complicated and there are definitely stocks that are overfished. Um, the, the good news is that in New England, um, we have a very comprehensive system of management. Um, the boats that we fish with have an allocation that they're allowed to catch annually. Um, our organization helps monitor that allocation. Um, the boats that are participating in this project also are running cameras on their boat 100% of the time to uh, track discards and create a new data stream to go into the scientific process. And so um, the fish that we are providing is some of the most sustainable seafood that you can eat. Um, that being said, like there are things that need to get fixed. And uh, that's also one of the great things about this program is we are working and supporting the fishermen who are building the solutions to fix the problems um, that exist in the fisheries management world. Awesome. Um, to go to you, Jess, real quick. Um, someone asked, where um, are your fruits and vegetables coming from? Um, just if you could speak to any, any partnerships you have with farms or anything like that for your fresh vegetables. And sure, sure. So, um, so two two area well three i guess three um different organizations involved with that so definitely good shepherd um did i not gosh did i not mention them before good shepherd food bank they're you know the the primary organization we've been working with to um to offer that out the once a month fruits and vegetables and then also healthy acadia's uh gleaning program gleaning program rather through the different farmers throughout maine um that's we've also been able to work with them to get um i think gosh we must have had maybe five or so um, days where we had someone from Healthy Acadia offering out um, fresh, um, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, at both of our locations at Bucksport and, and Ellsworth. And then, um, and then the other, the other um, fresh produce came from our garden. So that was really fun to have. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. 
Um, ben, I saw a question in there about the, um, if you feel like the organization, if you're feel financially um, sustainable for the future, or if you, what, what your financial plans look like moving forward for the program? Yeah, so right now we are working to do additional fundraising um, around this program. And, you know, we, we don't know what it's going to look like on the other side of COVID. Thus far, we've been in incredibly um, fortunate in the support that we've seen from the community um, and businesses that have supported this. So um, we've got enough money to keep it going through the spring, and we're going to keep doing fundraising around it. We're also trying to figure out other ways that we can uh, create revenue streams around this, whether that's partnering and creating products um, that can go back and kind of create, create a positive feedback loop on this type of things, but we're still in early stages. So our hope is that this can be a sustaining project at a smaller scale once we don't have as, as high of a demand. Awesome. And then I think the last question that I see in the chat here for you, Ben, then we'll unfortunately have to move on, but just someone's asking about um, the impacts of, of ground fishing to talking about how um, fishing lines have been an issue threatening species like the right whales. So if, if ground, speaking to the issue of that and ground fishing. Yeah, and so uh, that's a, a very, very deep question, and I can talk to you guys at length about whales and uh, line, you know, lobstering. For the groundfish fishery, that's not a, it's not an issue. Um, for uh, the different types of species that we catch, we either drag a net through the ocean, um, which does not have an impact on whales, or we uh, use gill nets, and you put gill nets in the ocean. But the boats that are participating in this project, and for the most part are fishing in Maine, they tend their nets. So that means they put their nets in the ocean and then they stay next to them. Um, and so that alleviates a lot of the problems that come out of um, having end lines, having gear in the water column um, without you know, and interacting with whales and other, other marine mammals. So there are definitely always the questions, but um, we are very confident in what we're, we're doing to protect the marine resources out there. Awesome. Thank you for fielding that. Those are, I know those are very complicated questions. You did a great job answering them in such a short amount of time. And I'm sorry, we don't have more time to delve into these questions, um, but you have the, the speaker's contact info if folks have any other questions about the programs um, or thoughts on the work that these amazing folks are doing. Thank you so much for being here and um, for sharing, sure sharing what you're doing and best of luck to both of both of you and in, in your work and getting healthy food to people it's 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 what we're here for and so thank you so much thank you all right so where are we we're going to now talk a little bit about the format of the sessions now that we're feeling super jazzed about why we're here and what we're doing um let's let's talk about how it's all going to happen um first of all this is not a webinar um if you went to the opening session you heard that it's not a webinar um you will all be participating um so we can gather our collective wisdom and our power um to do great work so get ready to have really engaging conversations and breakout rooms today and throughout the sessions. Um, so today is session one where we're identifying priorities. Um, we're going to present everyone um, with a pri priorities list that's been developed from our five regional dialogues in a statewide survey that happened this past summer and slash fall. Um, we will be discussing them in the groups and then voting on which priorities make the most sense for us to work on moving forward. Um, thinking about especially diversity, equity, inclusion, um, DEI, as well as climate change, which are two major themes that the convergence is seeking to um, thread throughout the throughout the project. Um, session two is going to be um, developing priorities. So then we're going to take those priorities that were chosen um, from our discussions today, and we will be envisioning how to make the most impact on those priorities. The what, the who, and the how. Again, centering DEI and climate, and starting to dive into the policy needs and implications of those priorities. So the policy is going to start getting woven in in the later sessions. And then finally, session three is organizing for action. Um, we're we're going to do something with what we're talking about. Um, we are going to spell out what kind of resources, funding, people, power, research, and policy would support this work moving forward towards collective action. After each session, all the input gathered from breakout rooms will be collected by the track team, and we will do our best to make sense of all of your wisdom and then deliver it back for the next session, which will then be again open for your feedback. So it's going to be a loop um, where everyone gets a chance to, to inform the process. 
Um, by the end of the convergence, we hope to build the outlines of collective impactful work moving forward, um, people being pe the people power behind it, and even greater relationships and greater trust to sustain the work. Um, we're also going to identify synergy across the tracks. So this one and then track A, which is looking at markets and track B, which is looking at production. And we're going to see how we can cross pollinate um, some of our priorities in our act directions of action um, and share those at our final reconvening event on March 11th. So that's kind of an overall roadmap. If there are any specific questions about anything, feel free to drop questions in the chat. We have folks who can answer. Um, but we're going to keep chugging right along and you guys are going to get a break from me and my flailing hands here and I'm going to introduce um, my teammate Amara, who's going to talk about our community agreements and introduce our storytelling panel to us. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Shannon. And thank you um, to Jessica and to uh, Ben for sharing your stories. Um, I just wanted to start by um, outlining our convergence agreements, which we touched on in the opening session, if you all attended. Um, they're also in the participant packet that Shannon mentioned earlier. Um, and, see, and these agreements are really to help us um, create a space where we all feel comfortable sharing. And they're adopted by the Maine Environmental Ed Association. So we are present. We are imperfect. We are transparent, brave, empathetic communicators. We have a right to self-determination. We prioritize process and we are better together. Similarly, um, we have support available to you. Um, if you would like to talk through um, any challenging issues that arise in this work, um, this is difficult work and difficult conversations that we're engaging in. So if you feel as though you need to maybe step away um, or talk to someone about this, um, you can go ahead and email this email um, that is listed on your screen. Um, and then also to schedule a confidential meeting with a support person. Um, and we have those available for both white and BIPOC folks as well. And then moving into um, our storytelling panel, just wanted to share this quote to ground us um, before we enter into this um, portion of our um, event tonight. Uh, the stories we tell will determine whether our society declines and self-destructs or whether we can heal and thrive. This comes from Harnessing Cultural Power by Fabiana Rodriguez. And so um, I am so um, grateful to uh, present to you all today um, our storytelling panel with um, some amazing folks who are doing uh, incredible work in the food justice sector. Um, Hanan Omar, who is um, a youth with Cultivating Community, who's also part of the Maine Environmental Education Association's Changemakers Network. Joanne Sipa, who also works with Cultivating Community um, and is a part of our Changemakers Network as well. Um, and Rebecca Lane, who works with the Good Shepherd Food Bank Building Advocates Leadership. Well, uh, welcome back. Um, hopefully everyone had um, really engaging conversations and y'all are really excited to share about it because we want to hear. Um, so we um, have a lot of breakout rooms and only a certain amount of time to do this, um, but I'm going to invite folks who feel strongly about a priority or something or some combination of priorities um, that was discussed in your group and you want to share and say why you think this priority should be one of the priorities that's chosen um, to move forward to work on for collective action. Um, so those folks who want to champion a priority in this way can put their um, um, name in the chat, drop it in the chat, um, which is probably not below me, but that's just the like language I feel like I'm using now. Um, and because we have so many folks, um, I'm going to ask people to stick to one minute and I will cut you off if you are doing more than a minute because I want to be able to hear from as many people as possible. Um, so hopefully you had a ch chance to touch base with your group about maybe who someone who would want to speak. Um, and if folks could just be putting names in the chat, um, we love to hear your one minute pitch for your priority. Um, so Lynn Holland, if you could go, you're up. Okay, um, 
we talked about the local partnerships and working with local people, local businesses, all types of businesses, transportation, food growers, food processors, even to a certain extent institutions so that we can create a foundation of making local bigger and also have consistent connections that aren't always at the mercy of the latest grant cycle because there's an awful lot of dependence on the volunteer element to fix things within the system that aren't working. Awesome, beautiful, under a minute. Thank you so much. That's great reflection and great info from your group. Allie Cook. All right, so in my group, we talked a lot about institutions. And so the kind of the three we kept going back and forth were seven, nine, and 10. Um, but mostly just focusing on how institutions, hospitals, schools, you know, could be doing better and whether that's, you know, purchasing more local food with all of the funds that they have, getting more local food into school systems. Um, and, you know, kind of like Jess was saying at the beginning that thinking about food as preventative health care and thinking about our major institutions is where we're going to see the most change. So seven, nine and 10 were our major ones talking mostly about huge institutions. Awesome, great connections to be made there. Um, let's do um, Susan from, there's a couple of Susans here. First one to put your name in, um, um, so it's number three, group three. Uh, it's group 15. Um, I added it later in the chat. Oh, so I see. I was You're highlighting. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, number three, improve tran transportation and mobility options. Mm -hmm. Our group um, seemed to talk about that quite a bit, especially um, in, well, in many areas of the state that there's not uh, uh, access, especially in the rural areas, um, for people to get to uh, food hubs or uh, markets, grocery stores that have healthy food. So um, actually physically getting people to food sources we felt was pretty, was very important. And um, so we were really interested in um, how that could be strengthened and that would strengthen our, our food system. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Susan. Um, Marguerite, group nine, what you got? Yeah, one of the priorities that we talked a lot about was priority six, providing nutrition and culinary education. We thought that like the school garden movement and cooking education it has a lot of momentum. And also we were talking about how like family and consumer science is kind of dying out in a sense. So a little bit of like uh, tension there, but then talking about climate change and how it impacts that and how, um, it has like a great impact and that it teaches kids to be stewards. And so in the future, they would care more about mm -hmm. our, you know, this generation, the older generations um, and about the future. So. Awesome, that education piece is great. Um, Becca. Thanks, I'll try to represent my group well. Um, so we, we actually spent a fair amount of time thinking about um, how some of these priorities um, seem to be addressing more like emergent need um, equity issues that have been created by the food system we live in. And some of these seem more like upstream root causes. So we kept getting, getting brought back to um, priority number one. Um, so keeping, keeping money in Maine, involving the government, really like having this as the basis that can lead folks to um, maybe be able to think about some of these pri other priorities. And we specifically tied them also to priority number four, combating food apartheid um, that we felt like had a lot of momentum. And also number seven, encouraging partnerships with local producers. Again, tying back to keeping those food dollars in Maine, growing the economy, but also not recreating some of the emergency need and inequity that our food system that we currently have has created, not re reliving that wheel. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I love all the connections that people are like drawing connections between the priorities. That's really great to see. Um, um, Anna from group two. 
Um, so echoing a bit of what has already been said, um, we jumped around between different priorities and um, one of the things that was kind of inspired from the earlier storytelling um, was the focus on the opportunity of education for all um, and how that really has the ability to connect to some of these other priorities. Um, and so if there is an opportunity for education, um, both around culinary um, skills and nutrition, um, but also weaving into that um, agricultural connections um, and maybe opportunities to learn about other resources that could expand access and pro provide assistance. Um, those are some of the kind of the ways it all weaves together. Um, all of these things came up as being very important and we spoke about um, how working collectively, um, uh, whether it's um, across, let me see if I can pull these notes real quick, um, like um, within a collective business um, or um, looking at um, partnering with other producers um, or the uh, hospital or healthcare systems um, can help uh, get resources out, but also be an educational conduit. Awesome, that's that's just about over a minute, but that was so great. Thank you, Anna. Again, like so many good connections being made. Love it. Um, Ron, group four. Hey folks, um, so we are kind of all over the place having fun with sticky notes. Hope you did. <laughs> Hope you did well yourselves. Um, I think uh, we had a number of them come up. The most uh, likely one was seven with the partnerships and that can be anything from healthcare being uh, the support for food access or you know, like the, uh, the fish story that we heard earlier today. Uh, the other part that came up fairly often was uh, for around food apartheid, whether that's uh, getting better food at the dollar stores like I always like to, to look at, mm -hmm. but uh, also that food apartheid is not just your food in the hand and food access is not just your food in the hand or the food that I grow, but it's also having the political agency to determine and shape the food system. So those were some crossovers that we put together. Fabulous, thank you, Ron. Um, Sam C, Sam Cotton from, from which group it was, you're up. Cool. I think it was 13. I'll try my best to synthesize what we discussed. We were everywhere and it was awesome and we could have used so much more time. Um, so uh, the thing that we kept coming back to, I think there was a couple of things, transportation, access to transportation, and also um, advocating for consumer economic empowerment. Um, we were, we did kind of keep coming back to um, advocacy, not necessarily being a a huge part of what we do in our day to day, um, but we want it to be. <laughs> and it's very important to be advocating for those um, people who need access to the foods that medically they like, medically they need the food that um, will not make their bodies hurt. And also, um, what they need for um, their own cultures. So not culturally appropriating um, different recipes. Uh, feel free to chat other group members if I missed a priority that you want to highlight. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you, Sam. Um, Adrian. Hello. Um, so we were also all over the place and had really wonderful discussion. Uh, but like others, um, there was a common theme in the um, interwovenness of these priorities. In particular, um, we felt that priorities six through nine were very dependent on each other. And if there was a way to kind of combine these to make a bigger priority, um, a good example that we talked about was a vegetable prescription program. In Connecticut, there's a successful program um, that can be looked at as a model, potentially. Um, in addition, um, Streamlining access um, to assistance programs um, could also have a, bit, a big impact on food systems and food security and isolation. And the last plug, um, I will always advocate for um, school meal programs, summer food service program. If you talk to me, you know I'm always going to go there. So in particular, I am really um, interested in priorities number two and number 10 to make sure Maine children have access to meals. Awesome. Thank you, Adrian. That's perfect. 
Um, Jimmy. So our group was equally covering a lot of ground um, and had a lot of good anecdotes. Um, a few themes that popped up were um, a focus on processing. Heather from Mofka had mentioned that a bill is going to be introduced this year that um, will open up the door to um, additional funding for uh, local food processing in Maine. I don't know too much about it, but direct your questions to Heather at Mofka if you have any questions. Um, and, but in that vein too, we, we had some folks from the emergency food world on our call and um, we heard some great anecdotes of how, you know, available commercial kitchens uh, that are being utilized to process food that enters the emergency food system for, you know, coming from gleaners, going into a volunteer groups, um, hands, processing it in the kitchen. So it's really interesting, kind of like the, the scale that, um, you know, we could be tapping into and acknowledging that this giant group of us probably have a lot of resources um, to contribute to a project like that. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. But you know, another thing that was brought up was just the value when we're talking about climate change and public health, the value of organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. on on the land and on our bodies um so I'll, I'll leave it at that but that was just another point that i think is worth raising thanks thank you jimmy all right so unfortunately this might this will be our last one i think there's so much good ideas out there but we do have to just keep moving along so malaya why don't you fin finish us up here hey everyone oh we just lost your audio um so we, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we we also flip flopped around to a lot of different priorities. We started on um, education, talking about cooking matters and SNAP, and um, then and also just about the um, impact um, on students who um, learn about topics like climate change through garden education um, and learn about how to both families and students who learn um, about food. Um, and then we really started moving into institutions as access points um, because we kind of started talking about the harvest of the month programs um, that works with cafeterias and just talking about how institutions are really an amazing way, um, whether it's a prison, a nursing home, a hospital, um, that they're amazing access points. And um, the more that um, they can really be like, yeah, food can really be used as medicine. If, um, that's and then that's about, a, that's about of, a minute, so to speak. Okay. Last 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, well, in conclusion, we wanted to just like put over overarching theme that none of this, like education, none of that matters if, um, there's not economic empowerment. And so we really, that was kind of like where we really ended just feeling like priority number um, one was really important. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for all your contributions. I fully recognize that this is just not enough time. You know, we could, I'm so sorry, we can't provide more time right now to really be able to, to continue to talk and to continue to share. So I'm going to ask you all now to do maybe a slightly difficult task, because it sounds like there's so much passion in this room for all these different issues. But we're going to put a Google form in the chat. And this Google form is going to ask you to choose four priorities that you want to see move forward to, to, um, to for us to be working on collective action. Um, think about the conversations you had in your um, breakout room. Think about some of the tidbits that you just heard from people sharing out how their breakout rooms went. Think about where's the energy in the room, where, where um, we have existing resources, existing momentum, what could be built on, what is most urgent, what could be leveraged. So much to think about. So if that Google form could be put in the chat, perfect, thank you. Um, if you folks could look at that, open up that form. If you are, have an issue with the form for any reason, feel free to um, drop your four um, priorities in a private message to Amara Afiji. Um, she'll she'll um, field anything that is not able to be communicated on the Google form. Um, 
we'll give folks um, a, a few more minutes here. If you could all fill out this form now and choose your top priorities. I see a question in the chat about weighted priorities. Um, we um, at this we 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 are we are in discussion about um, how we could reasonably do a weighted. We initially were envisioning ranked choice voting. Um, I would say just I would say just select um, choices as if they're not weighted. Um, but we we may. Um, I'm sorry, this is a very big answer. We were literally just talking about this. Um, I'd, I'd say leave, leave them not weighted. Just please select four that you have um, favor for because um, we're not sure of our ability to process them as weighted choices at this time. Unmute. So folks, just take another minute to fill that out. Um, that would be really excellent. Um, I know that there's all of these things deserve attention, but unfortunately, we're really looking to be able to um, come, come together around certain issues to really build those collaborative networks, build that infrastructure and work towards collective action. So we really appreci appreciate everyone's input um, working towards um, developing, developing these priorities and developing a synergy to move forward um, together. So I'd like to um, bring us to our closing here. Um, thank you all so much for this amazing evening together. Um, I want to emphasize that this is just the beginning of our work together um, during this convergence event and beyond. We really hope that um, this starts great conversations and that things are born during this event that carry forward into the future for everybody. Um, I would like to make a quick note that um, there is an optional facilitator debrief after this. I recognize the time if folks need to step away from their computer, that's okay. But if any breakout room facilitators want to stay on, for just a few minutes, they're welcome to. We're going to have a poem be read by one of our team members here at the end as well. Folks want to hang on for the last few minutes. But before we get that poem read, I just want to um, explain our feedback form. If that link could be dropped in the chat. Um, our, the, the feedback form will also be sent, be sent out in a follow-up email. But we're looking to collect information on um, on how we how we did, um, who needs to be invited, maybe who needs to be included. Um, there'll be room for you to provide um, issues um, for like a parking lot bike rack kind of situation. Um, give general feedback of this on the session, that sort of thing. Um, so if so, that link has been dropped in the chat and will also be sent to you. If you could please fill it out by the end of day tomorrow, um, that would be most appreciated. We we need your feedback to make this um, to build this process together. So again, we'll have a brief feed. We have a brief facilitator debrief um, after this. After we read this poem, for any folks who would like to stay on to talk for five to ten minutes about how the process went for them as facilitators, um, thank you all again for being here. 
Um, to close our session this evening, I'd like to turn over again to my teammate, Christina, um, who's going to bookend our, our evening together um, and, and read us a lovely, um, short and poignant poem to carry forward with our work. So Christina, if you could take it away and sign us off for the evening, please. Hey, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. It's like almost PJ and Netflix time. Um, but I wanted to just um, share this poem and really um, honor you all being here. So um, it's the Radical Gratitude Spell by Adrienne Mary Brown. You are a miracle walking. I greet you with wonder in a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination. You have chosen to be free every day as a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here, but I know you have swum upstream and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough, your work is enough, you are needed, your work is sacred, you are here, and I am grateful. Thanks everyone. Take really good care of yourself. Thank you, Christina. Thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you all for session two. Facilitators, feel free to stay on for a few minutes if you'd like to talk. Everyone else, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.